Welcome to FOSS North 2020, a virtual event. I'd like to thank our sponsors and our partners. Welcome. And now Hi, thank you. Have full control of the presentation. <laughs> All righty then. Well, I think I'm actually not going to do slides today. I'm just going to... Uh, I've been doing this presentation a fair amount, and I found that with a lot of these, sometimes doing the slides um, on the presentations, I, I end up getting better responses when I don't use them. So <laughs> I'll just uh, kind of speak to a lot of the different topics, and um, there is a structure there. I'm not just completely winging it. But um, if you could, um, you know, uh, with the comments and such, you can bring stuff up in the middle, um, but it might be easier to wait to the end. Um, but you'll have to let me know when things occur on chat so that I know that it's there. So, uh, and thank you guys for using Big Blue Button. Uh, that's what we use as well. And it's kind of great to sit there and see another group using it. So thank you. Um, so my name is Selena Bonvald and I'm the executive director of IEEE um, SA Open, which is a new um, open source platform that we're launching. And we're trying to raise the maturity level of open source. And so the name of this presentation is called It Takes a Village. And what we're trying to do is address the um, issue of role diversity and inclusion in open source. And a lot of times we are doing that through tooling and things of that nature, but we're also doing it through some certain mechanisms. And so I wanted to kind of, you know, talk about those. And so probably the first big thing is, is what is inclusion? Um, and inclusion is really, you know, it's different from diversity, right? Diversity is when you get all the different people that are there. Inclusion is when you set up an environment that's friendly to all of those and brings everyone in. The great thing about inclusion is a lot of times when you do it, you solve a lot of other issues in regards to that. And so, you know, that's kind of some of the points that I'll talk about today. Um, so why did we choose role diversity? Well, there's a lot of kinds of diversity that are out there today. There's a lot of stuff in regards to identity politics, right? There's things that, you know, we, we ask to get filled out on forms in regards to like our sex, our religion, our ethnicity, our, you know, sexual orientation, et cetera, agnosium. Um, we decided to go for one that we kind of viewed of as safe, which was role diversity. And one thing that I think that ends up being a really um, important element about that is that it does make things more um, product ready in regards to it. If, if you sit there and realize at work, there's a lot of different types of diversity. And, and when they go and they focus in on role diversity, it's, it's for some pretty concrete reasons. And so we'll go into some of those as well. Um, in inclusive, you know, it's not always what you think. And so that's one of the, some of the pieces that I'd like to go in through is that some people are normally thinking, oh, well, it's that you're friendly or you're doing things along those lines, but it actually ends up being a little bit more than that. So, um, one of my big lessons in regards to this is, um, I live with several teenagers and when I watch, I wanted to share some, um, eighties movies. <laughs> with the teenagers and watching those movies again with a lot of them there was a lot of cringe as they say in it which is where you know a lot of times where I felt very uncomfortable and realized you know how much we've come from back then when watching those movies to where we are now and I think that there's a similar movement going on in open source where we want to get past the cringe um, and one of those pieces you know that I may offend a few people on is meritocracy um, meritocracy, when it was first brought up, it was a joke. <laughs> it was actually talking about like how it wasn't a good thing to do. Um, and it, it, I, I feel like it's one of those things that's great in concept, but isn't all that great in implementation. We might know a few things like that, um, in regards to politics where it seems like it's going to be a great idea, but then you implement it and you realize that there's a lot of different broken things in regards to that. And so I'll, I'll talk to a few of that. I think the biggest thing on a lot of this, though, is, is remembering balance. Know your audience and your stakeholders and not just your current audience. Think about the audience that you want to have and the stakeholders you want to have. I think way too often we get caught up in just making sure that the people that we have right now are happy and we don't think ahead into the future about all of the other different people that we really want to work with and engage with. So 
expand your stakeholders, you know, sit there and think, oh, what are all the other groups that should be really awesome that are out there? Um, I find a lot of this happening in the EU uh, because previously it seems like open source was developer to developer. And we, and we did a great job on that, right? Apache's awesome. You know, Linux is awesome. Kubernetes is great. Um, but it's developers talking to developers. And we know how to do that. And we've done a good job in regards to doing that. But we haven't done a good job in regards to talking to nonprofits, oftentimes talking to academia, working with governments, doing all these things that can expand our scope, you know, and make it even better. And so you really need to think about expanding your stakeholders. And so for that, you need to make sure, of course, that you have good feedback loops. Um, one of the things that I find that happens for us in open source today is tooling. So many times our tools are gatekeepers. And one of the reasons our tools are gatekeepers is because they're very, very dependent on convenient data. And um, convenient data is my nice term that I like to use. A lot of times I think of it more as lazy data. <laughs> You know, it's like in GitHub when we sit there and we decide that we're going to count things like pull requests and commits and or maybe even stars rather than looking deeper in regards to everyone who participates in our community. It's only about the code. It's <clears throat> it's not about all of these other aspects that are so important to actually getting there. And then another aspect that I also think is really important is if we're not inclusive, are we actually open? Um, because a lot of times people are saying we're open, we're open, we're open. But if you've done all this technological gatekeeping, all this sociological gatekeeping, all of those different things, are you actually open? You're probably not. You might just be transparent. You might just be visual. I remember for a while there was a term that was going around, which was visual source, that basically some corporations came up with. Um, to uh, basically show you all the code, but you can't do anything about it. <laughs> so it's kind of like, eh, is that open? Not really. And I would al also argue that it's certainly not fair. And when you don't have fair and you don't have those elements, you're not going to be able to attract those other groups to come in and participate. And when you don't have that inclusion, I'm also going to argue you're not going to get the funding nor the sustainability that you would also like to have. So you really need to sit there and think about that dichotomy between open versus visual and doing good participation and measurement versus the lazy versions that we now do currently. Um, I think that also evolves a lot and I'm seeing a lot of discussions right now in the EU, especially from like Open Forum Europe and the um, UN and the EC and things of that nature and, and the United Nations about decision making. Currently, a lot of the open source models are a little bit more pay to play. Corporations come in, they form a consortia, you pay to sit on it and you go from there and you earn a vote. Um, we don't want to do that. Not only that, but to be quite honest, um, you're going to rub a lot of those groups the wrong way, especially if you're trying to do nonprofits or government or anything along those lines. Whenever you start excluding in that way, you start to create problems. Um, in America, we've got a lot of problems with racism. Um, it's very endemic. It's very systemic. It's been you know, baked in. And there was a lot of stuff that people did in regards to how you could earn a vote. You know, we had Jim Crow, we had poll taxes, we had literary te literacy tests, we had all of those different horrible things in place. Um, and we're still fighting that battle now. Um, and so I really would encourage you to, you know, look at that as to how does someone earn a vote and what matters to you. Um, Dries um, from the founder of Drupal did this really interesting article on makers and takers. And one of the things that he said in there is he was very sad because in Drupal, you know, he was a maker and he got to give and did all this awesome stuff. But then he felt like a taker in regards to Kubernetes and things of that nature. And I, when I talked to him, I sat there, I'm like, you know, that's kind of a, a, a poor, th poor dichotomy that we've set up in open source. You know, it really shouldn't be about makers and takers. Users are still givers if we allow them to be. 
They can tell us what's wrong. They can tell us what they like. They can tell us what's needed. They can, you know, sometimes fix those bugs. They, they, there's all these things that they can help with and do and work with us on, but we don't really give them an opportunity to be makers. We only let them be takers. And let's not just com, com, continue to do that. So one of the things that we realized when we were going through and doing the role diversity, you know, was the really big part of, of the importance of design. And when we're going in there and doing that, designers are very familiar with these problems in regards to e inclusion and exclusion and how to make those experiences work and not accidentally gatekeep and things of that nature. And so it's really important to talk with them in regards to it. But right now, the majority of the open source designers I know out there are exhausted. They're exhausted. They're sometimes unhappy. There's all these other things that are happening because there's so few of them. Nothing is really inclusive towards them. And they're struggling to basically because they care and, and things of that nature, but they're not able to get a clean, clear way to communicate um, with developers themselves and the current way that we've set up open source. And so one of my requests is to ask that people be more open minded in regards to a lot of that. And remember that when you're bringing in all of these other different roles and you're doing this, you know, inclusive behavior, the chain is a constant. Um, and there will be times where we find out that certain things that we did in open source are now cringe, just like we talked about for the 80s movies. Um, it will happen, but it's OK, because so long as we have kindness and forgiveness, we'll get past that. So um, I think to go in and look at a lot of this, I looked at a lot of the problems that I saw existing in open source today. And it's like, yeah, okay, so we talked about diversity, but it's more than that, right? So there's a lot of quality problems. There's a lot of abandonware. I see a lot of burnout and toxic community. I see a lot of ingrained biases and entrenched thinking and things of that nature. And I think once you go in there and you start to look at the role diversity, especially in regards to the quality aspects, you know, businesses don't hire all of these different roles for fun, right? They do it because they know to, to create a product that targets a set of consumers, they must put those customers first. If they don't do that and they don't have all of those things available, they won't continue as a business. So they do it for very selfish reasons, right? But we can learn from that. We don't have to sit there and also do what they do either, right? We can, we can do it better. And so that's one of the things that, you know, I'm hoping that we can address with that. Um, one of the things that we found in um, the Harvard Business Review has tons of studies, lots of studies for almost, I guess, the past 20 years talking about all the benefits of diversity, you know, where you get things like you get this value of expertise and experience. So you get this collective, you know, um, uh, accuracy with more perspectives, you get more innovation, you get more creativity, you know more eyes, bugs are smaller, right? Analytical thinking. Guess what? You bring in all those users, they'll also help you with some of those bugs, especially those user experience bugs, <laughs> some of the other design bugs, things of that nature. You also realize that you need to have better communication. And so you reduce the amounts of tribal knowledge. We have all this tribal knowledge baked into the developers, but we're not giving that out to all of these other entities and all these other different groups that we want to work with. If you go through and you do that, you'll you'll get a lot better at it and you'll have better and you'll have better tools. Um, you also get increased productivity and also reduced fear and improved performance. One of the things that's you know important to note about creativity and innovation is so much of that is born when you know our brains. When we're up here in the front, in our frontal lobes is when we're smarter and we can come up with more stuff. If you're fear-based, you're all the way in the back. And when you're all the way in that back lizard brain, you're just not as smart. And we would like to prevent that. We want to stay smart. We want to stay creative. We want to stay thinking in regards to that. So why did we go for roles first? Well, because of this whole, because we saw it as an, an easy functional thing to address first. You know, I'm not taking you completely out of developer land. I'm not taking you completely out of any of those different things, but just sitting there saying, okay, what are some of those different things? Um, also in the Harvard Business Review, they talk about, you know, diversity and how diversity without inclusion doesn't work. And sometimes inclusion isn't what you think it is. And so, you know, I think one really important aspect is actually accepting and acknowledging expertise. 
uh, a lot of time we talk about meritocracy and oh, blah, 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 blah. Well, that, ha that's, that only works if you're homogenous, if you're all one type. Um, otherwise, things don't work as easily. And not to mention that the metrics get really hard to understand. Um, you know, like one of the things that we discussed one time in one of the open source sessions I was in is leaderboards. You know, in gaming, you have all of these leaderboards. And, you know, leaderboards are great. Don't get me wrong. You know, I worked in the gaming industry <laughs> for over a decade. Um, but it's good when you have a set environment with set things and you have these very, you know, set metrics that you can go after and chase. You know, like one of the ones that we did at Hyperledger was on WeChat. They invented for themselves all of the translators uh, that we had a bunch of Chinese translators who came and created a group and their whole thing was to translate as much as they could into Chinese and back and all the stuff that they were doing from Chinese uh, into English. And they set up a leaderboard. That was great. First of all, it was them creating it. They were all doing a similar thing. They all felt like it was fun to do. They all had it on WeChat. You know, there was a good amount of um, healthy communication in regards to it. And that works. But that doesn't work if you try to bring in people who are doing other different things. You know, how do you equate translating with feature development? How do you create bug fixing with, you know, um, user interface design? Those things get wrong and they they create stress that isn't needed. Also, if you are one of those groups that, you know, is considered to be um, that's that's had a rough time of it, you know, say you've been dealing with things like inequities and um, stuff of that nature coming in and not acknowledging expertise makes it really hard to bring them in. It's not very inclusive, actually. It's actually good to sit there and say, oh, you've been doing marketing. You know, you're considered a leader in marketing. Let's bring them over and bring that expertise with them so that they understand who they are and what, what their role is and they can help with doing all of that. Um, also, you know, another reason we went for role diversity is, you know, it it's kind of silly, but when you're looking for a different kind of fish in a goldfish bowl, that's all you're going to get. <laughs> you're not going to get actual diversity. A lot of times, if you're looking in a bowl that's mostly made of, you know, a certain type of person. Um, and then, you know, again, I just like to stress the fact that businesses, you know, they don't hire these people for fun. They care about the roles. They care about the expertise. They know what they need for people to do. And, and we need to take a similar approach. Um, so we need to go where our, our special fish are. And sometimes we need to realize that maybe they need a slightly different aquarium. Maybe GitHub isn't the best place to put a bunch of designers <laughs> who need designer tools. <laughs> Instead, we should probably increase the quality of the open source design tools out there and work with them on it. Um, and so you have to go in there and respect their culture, understand their needs and desires, um, expecting them to come in and then fit you know, to carve their little puzzle pieces to fit into the holes that you have for them basically undermines a lot of those things that diversity will bring you. If you don't allow them to do the things that they need to do in the ways that they need to do it, you actually take away the diversity. And um, it it's completely counterproductive. So um, there are some cultural things that you should always remember um, in regards to ways to work with people, one is going to be vocabulary. You really need to make sure that you've nailed down your glossaries and things because terms mean different things for different groups. <clears throat> you need, really need to look at your tools and make sure that they are gatekeeping. Are they accessible? Are they collaborative? Do they allow these things to happen on, on the levels that the other people need for them to have happen? And then also, you know, remember location. You know, it's uh, 520 in the morning for me here in, in uh, Austin, Texas. And, you know, we have to remember the time zones and the languages issue um, so that we can make it easier for, you know, that diversity to occur. And also being sure that you have many, many avenues for feedback. It's not enough to sit there and say, oh, go put an issue in GitLab. <laughs> You've got to get out there and do more. You, maybe you want to go do some you know, OSINT, go do some open source intelligence. Maybe you want to do retrospectives. Maybe you want to do surveys or interviews or things of that nature please get out there and do more than, than that. And then remember the value of newbies. Um, nobody's better at knocking down the tribal knowledge than a newbie. They're good about asking the questions. They're good about you know any assumptive knowledge. Um, and then when they come in, they normally have a very clear perspective about quality and usability 
of what it is that you're doing. And so they can actually come in and give you a lot of that too. And so we're trying to reflect that in regards to the tooling. Um, that's why we're using 100% open source tools like Big Blue Button, Mattermost, and um, GitLab CE, um, so that we can go in there and do that. And we can make sure that um, we can change that as we need to, to address our audience's needs. Um, <clears throat> and then lastly, you need to reward your people. Um, you need to always think about how you're going to do that. Um, rewards don't need to be big things. I'm a big subscriber to Daniel Pink in regards to motivational behaviors and things of that nature. So many times it's it's about some type of acknowledgement. And it's also about being generous and kind with people. Um, and so you really want to look at doing that. And so and the other thing to remember is, is, is an ex it's an experiment. It's changing all the time. At IEEE, what we did is we created three advisory groups. Um, we have the technical advisory group, which is really similar to the model that we're kind of used to in open source. You know, once the project gets to a certain size, it has a technical steering committee, right? And they help make those other decisions because, you know, you've got the maintainers and the contributors, but you still need some people that are thinking about the overall perspective because you can't just sit there and, you know, if, if you are you know, 100% agile and you're only making decisions every, you know, two weeks or so, you're never going to have that big overall scoping picture as to where you are, what's your direction, where is all that going? You have to pull out occasionally, you know, and that's what the steering committees do is they sit there and go, what is the direction that we're taking, you know, this, especially like when I worked at Hyperledger, they were constantly going, where's the direction we're going? Where is that? You know, what are the different tools that we need to take? Um, we also had um, the, the second uh, group that we created is the marketing advisory group. And again, several of the larger open source projects have that, and but they call it the marketing steering committee. And what they do is, you know, they look at the positioning, you know, what does things look like? They're much more likely to be engaging with the designers and things of that nature. Um, unfortunately, the majority of the implementations that I've seen on there have been more pay to play. And so it's all the companies coming together and saying, oh, yes, let's collaborate. I'm like, let's let's open that out a little bit more. And so that's why we have these advisory groups is because I took them to another meta level and sat there and said, what are the best practices for doing these kinds of things? You know, how can we how can we expand this past pay to play and instead sit there and think about how do we better engage with academic institutions and, you know, foundations and nonprofit orgs and governments and things of that nature. And so that's why we took it to that next level. And then the third one that we did is the um, community advisory group. Um, I'm finding now, you know, life's an experiment, changes all the time, right? We're supposed to change. Um, at first, I was kind of like, well, this is the spirit of mentorship. You know, this is what this is going to be. But I find now that things are dividing out into two main camps. One, there's the users and the special interest group. So one of the groups that's really active is the education group because they're talking about, oh, what does academia and K through 12 need out of this platform to survive and do codathons and all these other different things that they want to do. So they're like, okay, there's, but then I also found that there's this governance thread that's coming through where they're like, well, we need to figure out when do we delete things because we've got this crufty stuff that's happening and how do we handle this? And how do we handle all of these other different aspects? And, oh, we need a, we need a man, we need a handbook, you know, how do all these different things work? And so they're like um, figuring that out. And then we're also, you know, we are IEEE and we do have a standards body. And so we're also working um, in conjunction with that group too, where the standards goes in and they're like, oh, what are all of the best practices? Here's what it's going to be. We can bring a lot of groups in. And so we have the open source software project governance, OSSPG. And they go in and they're doing that right now. They're like, what is all the different kinds of things that we need in regards to governance of open source and creating that. And then once that's done, we can bring that back into the implementation. They're two separate entities, but they're things that can work together well and be able to create something that's more fair and that works both within the constraints that we have at IEEE because it's hosted on our IT as well as you know what the community desires and the fact that we're open sourcing that as well so that anybody who wants to go in and create an implementation of it can. So uh, questions? Yes, <laughs> just unmuting and trying to get my cam on as well. Uh, 
I blame the Dell for the awkward <laughs> angle. Uh, we, we have a question from, from Marta. Uh, what would be practical examples of actions projects could make to increase inclusion to date? Well, you know, one, one of the things that we're doing is, like I said, um, breaking out of those normal um, constructs of you really have to go a little bit beyond just maintainer and contributor. Um, you need to have a nice little comfortable landing space for those volunteers to come into. And so that's, like I said, why we created the advisory groups. Um, one of the other things that we're working on right now, like I said, it's it's an experiment and we're, we're all learning. Um, and one of the things that we realized we needed was a better recruitment plan <laughs> for all these advisory groups because our advisory groups are getting tired after two years. And um, and so like we just did up a, a, a recruitment plan for um, IEEE SA's marketing team. Um, to sit there and say, okay, now this is what we need to do. We need to bring some more people in. We need to, you know, get some new blood in here. How do we go through and do that? Um, and so we're doing some different things in regards to that. And of course, we're totally willing to, you know, we share all of that everywhere. And so it's all on the platform. It's not always laid out as nicely as we might like to do, um, but we're working on that right now. In fact, we're doing some upgrades to um, GitLab CE for the websites. And once we get all of that done, then it'll be a lot easier for each of the advisory groups and their subgroups who will be launching their own little microsites. And so it'll be a little bit easier for them to lay things out and share things and make it more accessible. So you don't just have to go to GitLab. Instead, you can come, you can go and look at the website and poke around there. And then when you, you know, you want to get down and dirty in it, then, you know, there's people there to help you learn how to use some of those tools. And we're also expanding the tool set too. So that we can, um, you know, engage on like that. Right, right now, we're working on some proof of concepts for both Nextcloud, and um, and we're also looking at a number of the different uh, documentation collaboration tools: LibreOffice, Collabora, and um, OnlyOffice. So we're doing that as well to um, uh, make it a little bit easier for increasing inclusion. And to be quite honest, Marta, I think the biggest and easiest thing that you can do is a wiki. Um, you know, that's what we did at Hyperledger. Uh, I brought everybody onto the wiki and that's when the rest of the group got to see, for example, how much work the Chinese were doing. Like a lot of people thought, oh, these Chinese projects are dead. I'm like, listen, just because they're not showing up at your meetings that are in English and at three o'clock in the morning for them, <laughs> does not mean they're not doing something. <laughs> they are. <laughs> it's just not convenient for them or for you. And not only that, but God, who wants to speak another language at three o'clock in the morning? Um, so once I, once we created the tooling where we had the wikis, we had the multi-language capabilities, we had all that kind of stuff, they went gangbusters. And I think that's, you know, a very practical example as to ways that you could go and, and help in regards to that. Cool. Thank you. And that actually leads me to, to one of my questions. That, so I'll skip over one of the, the audiences here. So would you have a recommendation set of tools for various tasks or is that something that you keep in a repository or something somewhere yes. so that other people can learn? Yep. Yeah. So it, within the technical advisory group, they've actually, they're actually creating an entire process. Um, I purposely Re um, recruited one of my friends from PayPal. We used to work together on open source. Well, I used I was the director of InterSource under Dennis Cooper, and he was one of the open source guys, and we worked together a lot. And um, I sat there and I'm like, listen, I said, remember all that cool stuff I did in regards to the production readiness at PayPal? And because we ended up like redoing the orchestration tool from ideation to deployment to production, I'm like, I want to bring all that to open source. I said, so. I said, can you come and help me with that? And so they've gone through and they've actually created this entire process where, you know, first you propose it at the on the in, within the GitLab issues board. And then there's a template for it saying, you know, does it do this? Does it do that? Does it do this? And then the community goes and looks at it and they evaluate and they go, yeah, we think this is cool. Da, 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 da. And then we create a POC of it and that stays up for a little while, you know, sometimes weeks, sometimes months. Um, and then, uh, the community goes and like hits it with a stick and throws rocks at it and stuff, because the problem is, is, uh, not everyone accurately represents their open source project in regards to its features and usability. <laughs> 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 so we want to like test and make sure that it is actually what we think it is. And then, um, we start some stuff with the IEEE through their process too, where we do, you know, where if they okay it, then we start doing things like security audits and figuring out how to do it for infrastructure as code. And we do a whole bunch of other different things like that to make it ready to actually integrate into the platform. So it's about a 16, it's a 16 external steps and like 
close to 30 internal steps <laughs> within the IEEE IT infrastructure. So it's 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 not it's not a quick lift. Okay. I'm not gonna say that we're gonna be the fastest out of gate, but we are doing that. That sounds awesome. And is that something you could share afterwards if, if you have a, a link or pointer to to something of your sure. tool set? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Then, then I'll put it along with the with the talk description on the site afterwards. Uh, there's another link being requested actually by Yari uh, for the HBR study that you re referenced a couple of times. Is that there something you can show? There are so many of those, Yari. Uh, if you just go to HBR and look for um, inclusion and diversity, you'll sit there and see that there's a body of them. I think. Um, uh, I'll go. I can grab like some quick references to like three of them, but there's close to twenty that are out there. They've done some pretty extensive studying in regards to that. So, um, uh, so let me grab like here's two quick ones I can grab for you. Um, That's super. And for the ones looking, uh, watching the recording afterwards, I'll make sure to get them in the in the show notes. There we go. Super. Um, then there was a question from Luna here about the the open source group at IEEE. If that requires a membership fee, it does not. It does not. But it's confusing. Okay, it's not your fault. Um, so go to saopen.ieee.org and start there. Um, probably in trouble, but the SSO at IEEE needs needs an upgrade badly. <laughs> <laughs> and so what happens is you get taken over to the IEEE, you have to sign up for an account. And so um, you have to like, and it kind of looks like you have to pay for it. You don't ignore it, just create the account, ignore the membership requests, and then um, make sure to pop back over to opensource.ieee and then you can get into the platform. You can go and view the platform now. And in fact, a lot of those documents are up and on. It's just hard to find. Um, and so if you go to opensource.ieee.org, um, that's the actual platform and all of the advisory group stuff is completely readable and it's there. It's just, you have to go look for the group. Um, we haven't been able, we haven't gone through all the stuff that we want to do yet to make the, um, landing pages nice. And that's why we're doing these microsites is because I think these microsites will aid in, um, navigating those advisory groups in the future. And so that's one of the things that we're, we're working on. That sounds great. Uh, there was a follow-up question from Yara here as well. When it comes to open source tools are often text-based. Do you have any ideas or proposals for how to improve inclusion for people with dyslexia, for instance? Um, not yet, but you know, one of the things I'm loving, Yari, <laughs> is the new special font that I get to use on my Kindle. So um, I think that would be a great suggested feature is figuring out for all of these text-based things, how do we change some fonts? Why can't we do the dyslexia friendly font? <laughs> Why can't I decide that I want to look at those fonts, right? To make it a little easier for me. Um, it's, it's, I, that's one of the fonts that's sort of heavier in the bottom, so to speak, so that you, you get it. Yeah, it's heavier and then it has like some weird kerning in it too that also helps things not go. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm loving it for, you know, um, it, it makes it makes a lot of things a lot easier, and I think that that's but that's the kind of thing that I feel like we can have when we ha when we actually use open source tools, is then we can go in and start doing those things that we need, um, like being able to change the fonts and the languages. Um, and then uh, one of the things that we are looking at also, Yari, is um, you know for the designers and such, we don't have great tools for them, and it's also been a bit hard on our nonprofits too because. The document collaboration in GitLab kind of sucks. <laughs> you know, it's like do, trying to actively do pull requests and things of that nature is like, ah. And so that's one reason why we're looking so much at like Nextcloud or and one of the documentation tools as well is because we're trying to figure out which is going to have the best selection for us to um, be able to collaborate better on those. And maybe with those, we can more easily get you know, the text that we want or the readers that we need or things of that nature. And with the designers, you know, they need to manipulate graphics. And just to give you a little bit of the IEEE bias, we care a lot about open hardware. <laughs> it is IEEE after all. And we care a lot about open science because, you know, we've got one of the publishing arms in the world, right? 
And so we are looking at ways of changing each of those tools to better support our audience too. And, and so designers definitely come into play in regards to that, right? Chips are not graphics. <laughs> Sorry, tick, chips are not text-based. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. <laughs> Hardware is not text-based. So we have to get in some other different ways of doing things so that we don't you know, have this issue. Cool. So. I'm, I'm saw so that somebody was typing at, at the corner of my eye, but they stopped typing. I wonder if there's another one, another question coming up. So someone asked about the standards group, and that's the URL for the standards group. It's sagroups.ieee.org/osspg, and one of the it looks like someone in this group's already oh, Yannick is already engaged. Thank you so much. Um, it's it you don't have to be a member for that either. Um, what we're doing is uh, standards get to make several decisions as they're being created to decide like how open they are, what kind of group they want to be, you know, all these other different things. Because you can have everything from like, where we have like nuclear power plant standards, which are, you know, not everybody gets to say something. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but it's not as open for obvious reasons. You know, it's very, it's entity based. And then we have this one, which is individual based. And so what happens is everybody, so long as you've been participating, then, you know, you can continue to vote and do all of these different things. But if you don't, you won't be able to. Um, and so that's how they, they they do a lot of different constraints to both make sure that our standards don't get manipulated um, and corporate, you know, um, dealing with corporate dominance is a huge issue. And so we purposely do a lot of different constructs to try to make sure that that doesn't happen. So, yes, please join up now and start participating so that, you know, um, this will be moving forward. All of that, by the way, is run by Stephen Wally. Um, I don't know how many of y'all know him or not, but, you know, he's been a long time open source advocate and he's also done a lot with standards. And so he's kind of like the perfect guy to um, bring this forward um, within the standards group. So a lot of the, uh, so consider groups you want to have included. Um, to figure out who's missing. Um, well, I think the first thing to do is, you know, to, to look at your users, but also to kind of look at like, what is your mission? You know, what is your values and your purposes? And I think a lot of times when you go in there and you look at that, you'll realize, oh, there's a lot of stuff out there. So, um, you know, I'm kind of like this crazy lady who's been talking about open source and government since 2004 and open data and government. You know, I started right as America elected GW Bush. OK, so everybody thinks I'm a little nuts. Um, but of course, Obama then came in and was like really supportive of a lot of my work and, and mentioned it during the political campaigns. And um, and so, you know, that was like one of the things that I was talking about that everybody else was like, why would you do this? And one of the major reasons that I wanted to do that is, one, I wanted democracy to be actually, well, you know, we're a republic. We're not actually a democracy. Shh. We don't like to admit that. Um, but I wanted more representational aspects and I wanted the legislative process to be more open. And then I also saw that government was collecting an awful lot of data that I not needed to be open and citable to a granular level. <laughs> and so going in and doing that was like this whole thing. And now Europe is like, woohoo, you know, digital sovereignty, digital autonomy, GDPR, you know, blah, 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 like being visionaries in regards to all of that. Um, and so I think it's it's kind of like looking out there um, and sitting there saying, you know, what are our missions? What are, what is our vision? What is a lot of the different stuff that we're wanting to do on that? The other thing that, you know, I also targeted a lot is I had this group, you know, ironically named assistorg.org, <laughs> um, that was about nonprofits and that opened up everything, Florian. It was like, oh, right. Because to me, I was all, you know, nonprofit, I, you know, a lot of times I hire nonprofit people, um, who aren't open source you know, savvy yet because they are so community savvy and so used to member driven aspects that they really get it. In America, we have two kinds of nonprofits. We have 501c3s and 501c6s. Business consortia are C6s. Um, not what, what Europeans consider to be nonprofits are C3s, which are very membership driven. And so you have to have like the ACLU um, has like two arms. They have like the 501c3, which is completely membership driven, which isn't, which can only do very limited lobbying. And then the C6, where they can actually go and do the 
you know, the advocacy work and stuff like that, which by the way, I did for a year. Um, and so they're very, you know, so we actually have to have two separate entities in the United States, <laughs> which makes things a little confusing sometimes when you're donating, because <laughs> like one's a tax write-off, one is not. Um, but you can also imagine the one that is not, the, you know, the one that is a tax write-off is highly regulated and very much so into the membership aspects. And so I think if you expand your scope and sit there and say, you know, what are some of the humanitarian things that we want to address? That will oftentimes give you a lot of insight. I think that's why we have a bunch of things, you know, exploding with this Ukrainian invasion is because suddenly a whole bunch of people are sitting there going, oh, we we want to impact this. We we want to go in there and do that. And I'm watching a lot of that happen in the OSINT community. You know, the open source intelligence community has been around for quite a while, but they've been kind of like in the background. They get no love, you know, um, and now suddenly with being able to bring all of this information and knowledge out, it's people are awakened to a lot of those other different um, roles and responsibilities that are coming forward and uh, taking it very seriously. Um, I'm also finding that we're getting a lot of that at IEEE in regards to AI. And um, so we have this ethics and AI group that actually has created the 7,000 series of standards, which talks about when you're designing these things, how do you design to, um, as <clears throat> Google once said, don't be evil. Um, you know, they've gone through and like been a little bit more constructive in regards to that. So that would be my suggestion is looking at mission and values and, you know, things that you want to impact. Super, thank you. And then I haven't seen any typing out of the corner of my eye for a while. It's, let's, uh, let's see if there are more questions. Going once, raise your hand quickly. Going twice, going th three times. Then I'd, uh, I'd like to thank you for getting up so super early. It, it's been really interesting. And I'm super impressed of winging it virtually without a presentation or slides. That that's impresses me. <laughs> It's one of those things where I really want to engage with people. And, you know, one of the things that I do when I'm in person, right, is I have the slides, but like girls like this, click, click, click. And I'm walking around the audience and trying to figure out how to engage. In fact, I may have had a confetti cannon to fire at the audience when you're at South by Southwest. And sometimes I have candy that I throw out. And I, so I do a lot of different things that I really want to bring people in. One thing that I do love about the virtual format is the fact that I can sit there and see the chat. Um, after I'm done with doing the presentation and then I can sit there and go, oh yeah, because I feel like that removes, you know, one of those barriers, you know, because it's hard to get up, walk over to a mic and say, hey, I want to ask a question, speaking of inclusive behaviors. And I think it's a lot easier to come over here and go, especially when you can do it as you're thinking about it, you know, so for ADHD, I think it's like a lot easier to sit there and like, just type up a question because one of the things I used to do is like write everything on post-its. And so I would write it on post so that I could still stay and watch without having to remember, 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 and have that wheel spinning, you know? And so I was able to actually engage and then go up and like sit there and go, okay, here's my question. So, yes, but I have to admit, I, I, I do miss Europe. <laughs> <laughs> You're more than welcome to Gothenburg next year. I, I wonder if you can fly with a confetti cannon though. It's that might be. <laughs> no, I'd have to bring CO2 canisters once I got here. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely have to do that. That would be, pretty, be awesome. That would be pretty funny because, like, it was hilarious when I was like going to my talk. So I'm like walking through South by Southwest, you know, carrying all this gear, you know, where I'm like, got this thing all over my shoulder, like that, 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 And I'm like, oh my god, now I'd probably be frisked by security or thrown down to the floor or something for like carrying that around. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, next year, next year. Let's hope for that. Totally. And by the way, everyone, you can also find me on Twitter. I'm just Salona. You just have to spell my first name right. And you can find me on LinkedIn and, and uh, you know, other platforms that you desire. Um, so, uh, you know, ping me over there too. I'm on Twitter a lot. So it's probably the easiest. <laughs>